So this is water-wise landscaping. I'm, I'm really excited to teach this class. This is something that I um, am pretty passionate about because um, I feel like there's, that, that people feel when they hear water-wise landscaping, I feel like there's a lot of people that think, okay, my landscape's gonna look like a desert with sagebrush and sticks and rocks, kind of like the picture down in the bottom left. Um, but in reality, you can have beautiful landscapes with a lot of different colors, a lot of different textures that are lush and full that are also um, water-wise and low water, um, which I've, I've given examples of this all around. Um, many of these pictures come from um, all over Utah. I mean, the one, I think I took a, I took the one on the right, that's up in the Uinta Mountains, and then the one, the two on the, the middle on the left side and then the top one, those are at, um, White Pine Lake, I believe. I'm pretty sure I took those ones too. Um, so you can see that like water-wise, low water landscape can be really lush and beautiful. Um, I mean, a lot of it is, is gonna be the practices that you implement onto the landscape that you get this beautiful landscape without having to use as much water. Um, so to start out with creating a water-wise landscape, um, there are things that you wanna make sure that you're doing, which is pretty much like any landscape project that you're gonna be, gonna be doing, right? So you're gonna plan and design before you plant. You wanna analyze your soil. You wanna make sure you're keeping your lawn size practical, um, making sure your irrigation is gonna be efficient, using mulch, um, maintaining it, and then selecting the appropriate plants. So starting with planning and designing before you plant, um, I'm using the LocalScapes uh, house plan view here. LocalScapes is a, it's a word that's made up by, I think uh, the Jordan Valley Conservation Garden. Um, they kind of made up this LocalScapes word which just means it's a, it's a certain type of landscape for Utah because we're so unique here. Um, but a lot of their principles fit in with just doing any landscape design, which I really like. So I'm gonna use them as a way that you can plan out your landscape. So having your central open shapes, which can be your turf areas, which can be, um, if you don't wanna do turf, you can just do gravel or you can do artificial turf just as long as it's an open shape that's separate from your pathways, from your plant beds and things. Next are your gathering areas, which are just areas to sit and relax. Um, your activity zones, like your vegetable garden, play place, um, a chicken coop, those types of things. Pathways, all the things that are connecting all the pieces together, and then your plantings, which is everything else around it. So that's one way that you can start with planning um, a design, just having that in mind. Cause that's, that's the first step I think, because if you just are like, I'm gonna make my landscape more water-wise um, and then you go out and buy a bunch of water-wise plants and throw them in your landscape, but you haven't implemented a design, you haven't implemented new irrigation system, it's all gonna just be a big mess. So planning is gonna be your first step in being able to do that. Um, and then this is an example from the local scapes park strip class. Um, just having a design for your park strip even to make it more, more water wise and, and low water. Um, and you can see in this um, example here that it's, it's beautiful and lush, lots of color. Like it doesn't look like a deserty looking park strip. It actually looks really, really beautiful. And um, I mean, for me, I would never think, man, that looks like, it's a low water park strip. Uh, well, maybe I would, because I know what plants are there, but <laughs> I feel like most people that see a, a really lush kind of planting don't think to themselves that it's low water. They just think that looks really beautiful because of all the lush plants and colors and things. Um, and then also planning out your plants, but also your irrigation as well, making sure that your, your irrigation is gonna fit your 
your plan, right? So um, making sure that your irrigation is set for the low water plants. And if you need to make modifications and you need to do that before the plants go in, um, otherwise they're gonna be getting too much water. I mean, all plants need a little bit more water when they're establishing, right? So that's just a given. But a lot of the low water plants, once they're established, a lot of them don't need a ton of water. And so you wanna make sure that your irrigation is set to be able to handle that. And then also having your irrigation for your turf areas, if you have turf and then your plant beds um, on different zones, because if they're on the same zone and they're getting the same amount of water, then your low water plants are gonna die because they're drowning. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about irrigation, but just making sure to design that irrigation before you put in the plants is really important too, or have the plant um, design in mind and then putting in the irrigation with the plants. Um, so next is analyzing and amending your soil if needed. Um, you just wanna make sure because with a lot of like our low water plants, they don't like really heavy clay some of them can tolerate heavy clay soil, but a lot of them more like your, your loam soil. That's Loam soil is usually the best. And what, what I mean by loam is I mean that it has a good amount of clay, silt, and sand. It's a mixture of all those together that kind of create this really nice um, texture that allows water to seep through, but it also retains enough water um, that the soil is able to give water to the plants, right? Um, so loam is that really good mixture of all of those. And this is a, a triangle that you can use to be able to find loam if you know what percentages you have. Um, if you need help with analyzing your soil, um, USU has, um, they have like a, I think it's a soil like testing kit or something, or you can take in a sample of your soil to them with like a core and then they'll be able to analyze your soil for you. And you can go to the extension for that. Um, and then there's also ways that you can do it yourself that I found through the USU extension website as well. So I have those links on up there on the top right. Um, and remember these slides will be available after the class is over. And so if you need those resources, they're going to be there on our website um, with the PDF slides. Um, yeah, so like we were saying before, a lot of native plants, native meaning like Utah natives, a lot of them grow in like really sandy, rocky soil, right? So if you're trying to put those into your super high clay soil, and then you're watering that for an hour, um, three times a week, then that plant is not gonna survive because it has a specific need for the soil. Um, so you need to make sure that your soil is gonna be at a good spot to be able to take the low water plants and not um, give them too much water and not kind of suffocate the roots, right? So if you have heavy clay or compacted soil, you need to, you need to amend that with um, you can add organic matter with homemade compost. You could do topsoil. You can add like a turkey compost is really one. Um, this neutral mulch I've used before and it's really nice. There's like soil pep or there's, um, or like the, just like kind of even bark mulch. And there's like really fine bark mulch that you can kind of turn into the soil. Anything to kind of get some more organic matter into that soil. Um, and kind of break it up, give it some air in there is going to help amend that soil. Again, Utah State has a lot of really good um, resources on kind of uh, soil analyzing and also soil amending. So the next one, keeping your lawn size practical. So, so with the local skates program, this is something that's really important because one thing that they emphasize is the fact that most Utahns don't use the amount of lawn that they actually have. Um, and usually when you build a house, lawn is the immediate go-to for any landscape, right? So you build a house and then you lay sod or you put down seed. And then you're, you're kind of cutting out little sections where you want a tree or you want some plants and things. And that's just not 
the way to do it because it, it makes it so that you have a bunch of lawn that's not being used and lawn uses a lot more water than other things so if you're wanting a low water landscape but you want lawn you need to keep the the size practical to your to your needs and what you're planning on using it for um so these are two examples different examples um but they're both not really good uses for for lawn right so the one on the left there uh is this little strip it's less than eight feet wide which is not good for a lawn area because a sprinkler can't water anything less than eight feet uh, wide. They can't water it efficiently. So water is going to be spraying. You can see it even on the fence there. Water is spraying on the fence and then it's going to be spraying over the sidewalks. So you're wasting water that way. Um, and then that yard is not really usable. Like what, what are they going to be using that kind of just strip of random lawn for, right? Um, they could have they could put a, a nice plant bed there that doesn't have to be spraying the, the fence and ruining the fence and and watering the the sidewalk um but then on the other side of the spectrum is is a lawn that's just huge and like i don't think that they would use that much area of lawn um maybe i don't know i have a a teacher from college that he purposely planted a huge lawn because he has 10 children, I believe. And so they play a lot of sports. Their family's very sporty. And so he, he did a huge field of grass on purpose because they liked to do games and play sports and stuff. And so that was like, he planted that specifically, specifically for that. Oh, sorry, my phone's going off. It's a telemarketer. Woo! And then on silent. Um, so this kind of a use for lawn is not very practical either, right? Because it's it's humongous. No one, I don't think a lot of people use that much um, grass area. And not only is it not really practical, but maintenance on it is constant. Like they're gonna be mowing this every single, um, every single week, pretty much like, I, I think my, my parents mow their lawn every week. Um, so it'd be mowed every week. And then we have a bunch of stakes around all the trees and the trees are planted in the yard. So we're having to mow around the trees and then take a trimmer and try to trim around the stakes without cutting into the new tree. Um, and then it's a lot to irrigate right? And where it's not used, it's basically just wasted irrigation water, uh, watering something that's not being used. Because if you have a lawn area, then you should, you should use it because that's, it's, it's planted there to be something to be, to be walked on and to be used. Um, so then this is a, an example of like a front yard. So you can see tons of grass. And a lot of this is not really not really used. Like nobody walks in a park strip on the grass just to walk on the grass and park strip, right? So the park strip doesn't really need grass. Um, the only part of the lawn area that's that's probably used here is like the front area. Like nobody really ever goes on the side of the sidewalk. So this can kind of you could cut a lot of that grass out and still have a good amount of lawn and have it look really nice still. Um, and then this family, they actually did go through the local scapes program. So they, they took out their park strip, uh, the grass out of the park strip, and then they did cut their lawn to be smaller. And it looks awesome. Like not only is the lawn size practical, but the rest of their landscape looks really good too. And most of the plants that they put in there are either low water or medium use water, which is awesome. Like, and it's beautiful, lots of color, lots of variation. It's awesome. Um, and it really like increases the value of their home. It increases like the way that it looks. So low water, low to medium water, I guess, use landscape right here and it's, it is beautiful. Um, or using artificial turf. So this is kind of with the lawn size sort of just because Artificial turf is something that you can use. Um, we have a really good example on the right there of a low water landscape. This is probably in either like Arizona or California, somewhere where 
they don't get a lot of water. And so this is an artificial turf plot just to create that kind of central open shape, have something for the eye to rest on. And then they have their other plantings all around and all those plants are low water as well. Um, and so it's, I mean, you don't have to irrigate it. There's not really any maintenance. Sometimes you have to blow leaves and things off of it. Um, it's, it's green all, all year round. Um, but you don't want to put it on places if people are going to be walking their feet, especially if you live somewhere really hot. It can get really hot. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> and then you can install it into areas that are smaller than eight feet, right? Because it's artificial turf, it doesn't need to be watered. So you can do it in, in smaller areas that you feel like needs kind of that little central open space. Um, and then on the left or on the right side, that's a really fun way to put something in your backyard that is usable and it's artificial turf. You don't have to water it, um, but you're able to use that area and have it be low water. So next is irrigating efficiently. I'm making sure that your irrigation is gonna be efficient for what you're using it for, right? So if you have your turf areas, you want to make sure that your spray heads are have head-to-head -head coverage, meaning that the spray from one head is reaching another, another head. So we can see it on here really well, um, especially in the middle where I have the arrows pointing to the good one and then to the bad one. So you wanna make sure that they're, they're reaching each other because that's going to be the most uniform um, irrigation pattern. And you want to use the spray or rotary for turf. Um, you use different irrigation for different places. Um, and then remember with that, you don't want to do any areas smaller than eight feet wide because you don't want to be irrigating your, your sidewalks, right? It doesn't make sense to water your sidewalk. Um, so these are some different things that kind of go in line with your spray or your rotary head. So we have just kind of a bunch of pieces and, and things that are things that um, like with the, the spray, the spray heads, uh, I have those up top, little red and, and blue ones. And those, uh, the different colors indicate either spray pattern or um, how much water is, is coming out. It just kind of depends. Um, but those those will mean different things. And then there's the tools that you use to do any adjusting that's needed. Um, and then on the bottom, we have like a rotary head. And then on the bottom right, those little blue things, you put those inside the rotary. You can kind of see it in the picture above with the rotary head with the little white thing inside of it. So you put that little blue thing that's inside of the black part that controls how much water is coming out of the, the sprinkler the sprinkler head and then how like, um, it's like how you can also do how, how far the water is shooting as well. And you can adjust that also. So there's a few things that you can do to be more efficient with your 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 irrigating, um, and adjusting is something that is a good thing to do. Making sure that you have head-to-head -head coverage, making sure that your heads are are straight um, in your grass, meaning that they're not leaning or anything. Um, making sure that your your rotary heads, if you have it on an angle, that the angle is correct, that you're not spraying all over the sidewalk. That if you have it like an area that's like an acute angle, right? That your spray head is adjusted so that it's just doing that whenever you have a different head on the on the sprinkler that is only in a 90 degree angle, right? Um, and then drip irrigation is for your plant beds and there's different types of drip irrigation. It'll depend on what type of planting that you do um, or just whichever you prefer. Um, inline drip is shown on the left and then um, source strip is shown in the middle and then on the far right those are the different little um, like heads that you put into the the spaghetti tubing to adjust the amount of flow that's coming out so there's lots of different things that go with irrigation I'm not going to go into a ton of um, specifics just because we, we we do have an irrigation class 
um, that goes into more specifics on pieces and how to put them together and how it all works. Um, but just knowing that this type of irrigation is for, for plant beds and this type of irrigation is for your turf areas is gonna be the most efficient way to do it. Um, so next is using mulch. Uh, mulch is really good because not only does it make things look really, really finished and really nice, it does help retain moisture um, as well as preventing weeds. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna get weeds if you use mulch, but it does help prevent them, especially if you do the mulch thick enough. Um, and over time, it also breaks down into that organic matter that it can kind of get mixed into your soil. Um, and then also it hides your drip lines in your plant beds as well. Um, one con to mulch is the fact that it does need to be replaced over time. Either the color fades or it's just slowly kind of breaking down into your soil, right? So it is something that you like might have to revamp if you're like my parents, you do it every 10 years. <laughs> um, but it just kind of depends on how like you're okay with things looking or, or whatever, but mulch is a great thing to, to put in. Um, and that's bark mulch and then your stone mulch. So that's stone mulch is not gonna be breaking down into your soil, right? But, um, oh, which I have in there. It doesn't, it doesn't break down, but it does everything else. It discourages weeds, it adds some insulation, helps with water retention, hides your drip lines. Um, but then this one, it can also have to be replaced because the color does fade on them or they get moved around and things. So the next is uh, maintaining appropriately. So with having a landscape, there's always maintenance. Um, but, but if you stay on top of it and it's something that you just take a day to do, you usually can, can get on top of your weeds. You usually can make your yard look really good. Um, and then there's not a lot more that you have to do other than maybe occasional weeding and things. So I have on here just some like basic stuff. So like, for example, springtime, you're raking the leaves out of the bed that you didn't get in the fall. Um, you're finishing cutting down and cleaning up your grasses and perennials, doing your spring weeding because of that snow, all of the seeds from previous weeds have now been, the snow has watered them and they've been insulated. And so now they're growing, right? So it's springtime. It's just kind of a given that you're gonna have to weed in the spring. So spring weeding, this is a good time to mix in compost and applying pre-emergent for, for weeds. So, um, and pre-emergent will help any weed seeds that are in the ground still or gonna be getting in the ground. It'll help discourage them from, from um, germinating and things. It kind of creates a barrier. So that the either they germinate, but then they can never make it up out of the soil um, and then they die. So that's pretty much all you have to do in the spring. Um, and then in the summer, it's like maybe occasional weeding and some deadheading sometimes, right? But most of the time, like things are still looking really good and you don't really have to do much. Um, and then once winter prepping kind of fall time is coming around, you want to start cutting down your perennials and your grasses. Maybe some people like to keep their grasses up because it helps add some interest in the winter. Um, it's kind of a personal preference thing. You can do a final weeding at this point. Um, you can pick up fruit that's fallen from any trees and then also raking your leaves is something you can do. So, I mean, if the correct practices have been put in, your maintenance shouldn't be something that's, that's super hard to do. A lot of people worry that putting in plant beds and things is gonna make your maintenance go away high, but um, even listening to the people through the local seeds program that have cut out a lot of their lawn area and have put a, a ton of plants, they even say the maintenance is not even that bad. One lady's like, I go out for five minutes and I'm done maintaining my, my beds. So it might just be something they have to just be a little bit more aware of, but it shouldn't be like a huge problem if it's something that you and especially if it's something that you, you're caring about and you and you like looking at, right? You have these beautiful plant beds and you want them to continue to look good. I feel like it'll be a lot easier for you to be like, okay, I'm gonna spend 10 minutes and go out and weed them today. So um, making sure that you're staying on top of maintenance is 
is important is an important part of having any landscape, but also a low water one. Um, so the next is selecting appropriate plants. And so when you go to the nursery, you want to make sure that you're reading the plant tags. And so these plant tags are awesome. They tell you what size the plant's going to get, how much light it needs, um, how much water it needs, what it's going to look like, what zone it does well in. So reading your plant tags, you're going to want to, to know um, how to find the information on them. Um, and if you're doing low water uh, landscape, then you look for plants that say low water. Um, so like the one in the middle, this blanket flower, it's moderate to dry. So it can take a little bit more water, but these actually are do extremely well in low water conditions as well. So reading that and just making sure that this plant is gonna be okay if I have it with all of my other low water plants. And then also making sure that you're checking the light requirements. Um, if you have a spot in your yard that's super shady, you don't wanna put a plant in there that's full sun. So it won't, it won't do super well. <laughs> the blanket flowers, I mean, blanket flowers, I've seen them do okay in part sun, but um, they just, like, it's just not the best that they could do. And usually they, they'll just struggle in that kind of a different environment. So making sure that you, you know your areas in your yard that are shade or part shade or, or full sun, right? And then making sure that you're getting the, the right plants for those areas. Um, as far as plants with turf go, if you want to go to more low water turf, um, there are some low water turfs that do really well. So this is called buffalo and then there's also blue grama as well. So blue grama's on the bottom, buffalo's on the top. Um, they use quite a, like, quite a lot less water than your typical Kentucky bluegrass. They are a warm season grass, which some people don't like because so for example, right now we have some, I think it's, I think it's a uh, buffalo grass, I think, um, but it's not yet greened up. It's starting to, and it should be like pretty green by the middle of May, but it's not green yet. So it's kind of behind everybody else's grass, um, but it's, it's extremely low water. And like, honestly, I worked at a, a place at Utah State and we had, we had this in an area that got like zero water all year long. And it would kind of struggle when it was super hot and it hadn't gotten any water, but it was still like slightly green. So if we were to have watered it at least like once a week, it would have done awesome. And it would have just been like any like, well, it's a little bit different because it kind of has a blue green, like a blue green kind of a hue it doesn't handle high traffic well either. So like if you're driving trucks and stuff on it, but if you're running on it and just playing on it like normal, um, it should be just fine, but it's a little bit different. It, it does have kind of that bluish hue, but if you're wanting to go really, really low water with your entire landscape, then doing this kind of a grass might, might be something that you, you might want to try. Um, Let's see, that was, that was a mistake slide. <laughs> so let's see. So I'm gonna be getting into some kind of specific plants that are low water and we'll kind of be talking about them specifically. Are there any questions about anything that we've done so far that you haven't answered, Dave? I'm just kind of waiting. I, had, I don't see any. And if that's the case, then we can, we can keep going. If you have any questions, please put them. Yeah, just go ahead and keep going. Okay, perfect. So, some trees here. Oh, this is gonna go. All right. So first, so I'm going to talk about some trees. A lot. Some of these trees are quite large. So, just kind of keep that in mind um, <laughs> that some of these trees can get kind of big, but. They are ones that are low water. So if you're if you're really wanting to to do full 
low water, you have a space that you just need a huge tree, but you don't, if you don't have a lot of water to give it, right? This one is going to be awesome, your white fir. Um, it takes a really long time to get to be humongous. So just kind of keep that in mind also. Um, but then this guy is full to part sun and also the hardiness zone all, it goes down to the zone three, which is, which is pretty low, um, which also makes it really nice because it can be used in a variety of situations. Um, next is your Rocky Mountain Juniper. So this is, I think this one is a, is a native to Utah. Um, it's one you see up in the mountains all the time. And the main, those mountains, they only get water when it rains, right? So these guys do really, really well up there. Um, it is one that you could put into a low water landscape. Um, just kind of keep in mind that sometimes your Utah natives, even though it's a native to Utah, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna do amazingly well in your yard because some of our natives um, are grown in kind of specific conditions that they need. So for example, this guy probably wouldn't be able to tolerate clay soil because he is grown in pretty much sand, right? So just kind of keep that in mind with your Utah natives. That sometimes putting a native in your in your landscape is not gonna, it's not gonna do super well. Like uh, an aspen tree is another really good example. They look beautiful, right? Um, they look really beautiful up in our mountains and they look awesome. And so lots of people want them in their landscape. But the problem is, is that aspens, they, they need those higher elevations um, to do their best because they can get, it's a type of fungus that in the higher elevations, they can't, they don't get it. But when they're down lower in our kind of areas, they'll get that fungus. And so that's why you see a lot of aspens, if you've ever seen one in your neighborhood or whatever, all the leaves will have little spots on them. Uh, my parents, I mean, we live in, we live in Manaway, so we're still like pretty high, but there's no natural aspens around here, but we have aspens in people's yards and pretty much every aspen that I have seen in Manaway all have the fungus, um, which it just is not very good for the tree's health. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. If you're looking for for solely Utah natives, sometimes that's not the best way to go. Um, because there are a lot of other plants that aren't Utah natives that, that do really well in a low water landscape kind of situation. Okay, so let's keep going. So another tree that is awesome um, is the Austrian pine. They have these on the Utah State campus and they look awesome. Again, they're one that can get really big, but they tolerate not a lot of water um, and they're really beautiful. And they're one that can get big and full and they look great. Um, these ones do need full sun, but then they go down pretty low in hardiness zone as well, zone four. Um, this one, I put this one on here because I, I did have, well, I thought of doing big tooth maple, um, which is, uh, you see big tooth maples all the time up in Utah mountains. But the problem is, is that a lot of big tooth maples are kind of, uh, they're not very reliable on their size or their color. So it's kind of a game with with uh, big tooth maples. And also they're not ones that were that are sold in a lot of nurseries. Um, so this guy I did as a replacement because it has a similar color. And honestly, I think it's a lot cooler. It is low to medium water, um, probably more on the medium side, but it can tolerate a little bit lower water, but you just might kind of have to see where you end up placing it. But this guy is really cool. Um, the bark is really unique in that it kind of peels off. Um, so it just, it looks really cool. The leaves are different than other maple leaves, but they still have that really beautiful red color. Um, they have a really nice shape as well. And they can get, they can get to a pretty good size. Um, and they do, they do well in our zone also. Um, next one is also one of my favorite trees. Um, it's a ginkgo. These trees are very awesome in the fact that they're low water, but they have this amazing fall color and then they have really unique leaves. Um, they can get pretty big. There are some uh, cultivars, I think, that, that are a little bit smaller. 
Um, there's some that stay skinnier. So you just kind of have to find which one's gonna work for where you wanna put it. Um, but they do, ginkgos are usually more on the big side, I would say. Um, if you want a ginkgo tree, it's always gonna be one of your bigger trees. Um, these guys are just really awesome though because they're low water and not only that, but there is evidence that these, these this type of tree um, was, was alive when the dinosaurs were alive. So the fact that it's lived through all those times just kind of goes to show what a good kind of hardy tree it is. Um, so this guy is a really, really good one. Um, this one is one that not a lot of people, well, I feel like it's not used enough. Um, it's, it's an awesome tree because it, as far as trees go, it's kind of in the medium size, 35 feet tall. Um, that's pretty medium if you're, if you're going off like 100 feet, like it's, it's smaller than medium, right? So medium sized tree, um, awesome uh, blooms, which bloom in the summer, by the way, which you don't find a lot. Um, you don't find a lot of trees and shrubs and things that bloom in the full summer. So it's awesome that this tree does because it's, you have all of your spring blooming trees right now, right? They're all blooming. All the crab apples, all the plums, all the cherries, they're all blooming right now. And they're all gonna go green. And then summer comes and all of a sudden there's all these golden trees everywhere. Um, if there are more of them, there's not a ton of these trees around. Um, and then they have a really interesting fall little pod that comes after the flowers. Um, and so it has, and they're kind of like little lanterns, which kind of looks kind of cool. Um, and then the fall color is yellow as well. So it's just, this is a really good tree and it's low water, which is really awesome. Um, another one is Zelkova, which I don't think enough, it, it's used enough. Um, again, it's a really unique tree, has a more of like a base shape. So it's a different kind of shape of tree. They have really unique looking leaves and then they have that brilliant red color that people love. Um, and it's low water as well. This one is a little bit more on the taller side, so 60 feet, right? Um, but this is an excellent low water tree. Oops, next are our shrubs. Um, this one is one of my favorite low water shrubs. It, it is like smaller. Um, I did the height and the spread wrong right there. So the height is supposed to be it only gets to be around like one to two feet tall, maybe even less. And then the spread is one to six feet. So it can actually, it's, it's a its a really good kind of ground cover type of thing, but it is a shrub because it has that woody kind of growth. Um, really awesome looking. It just spreads over an area. They have these really, the leaves are kind of, the leaves are kind of like, they feel thick. They don't feel squishy like a succulent, but they feel like kind of like cardstock paper almost. Um, and then they have these little pink blooms in the spring, which all of our, we have this green leaf manzanita at um, our gardens. And so all of them are blooming right now. And then they'll continue to bloom um, throughout the year too. So I really like this, this shrub. It's a really good one for a low water landscape that kind of covers an area um, and without, not, without a lot of water. Um, oh, and these guys are also full sun. Um, another one is sand sagebrush. So sagebrush is uh, one of those plants that I feel like a lot of people hear the name and they're like, oh yeah, sagebrush. I don't want any sagebrush. But there are actually some that are pretty cool. And this is one of them. I really actually like this guy. He looks different than any of the other sagebrushes. Kind of still has that silvery color, but it's a different texture. It's more kind of feathery, right? Um, height and spread is three to four feet. Um, and this is a very low water use, which is even better than low if you're looking for water-wise, low water landscape, right? Um, it does have a bloom, which is yellow, and then the bloom time is summer to fall. Um, this is this shrub is curl leaf mountain mahogany. Um, this is a really awesome low water uh, shrub. Um, it, it can get to be 12 feet, which, which people are kind of surprised at with shrubs, but I mean, the thing that makes the shrub is the fact that it has many branches at the bottom. Um, so it's a bigger shrub, but if you have an area 
they're like, I just need kind of like a really good bushy thing in this area. You can put this guy. Well, water has, the blooms aren't very distinct. I have a picture of the blooms down the bottom there. Um, but then it gets these really interesting little seed heads that are kind of curly and um, really interesting. So it kind of just makes it look kind of fuzzy and it's just a really nice looking shrub that, um, that you can just kind of put in an area that needs to fill, fill in. Um, next is a uh, slow mound mugle pine, which this guy is awesome because not only is he low water, but he's a little bit more on the smaller side. So height is three feet and then spread is like three to four feet as well. Um, and these guys are really awesome. It's just a really good kind of compact mounded shaped shrub. And so in, in this type of a, a, this type of an evergreen, I don't ever feel like I see this evergreen and I'm like, I bet that thing uses like very low water. Um, Cause it's just so green and lush, right? But this is a low water use plant and it does really well. Um, so this one, it's technically a perennial, but it's kind of in that shrub size. So I put it here. Um, so it's a red yucca. These ones, they are more on, they need more of like that warm temperature, but they can do pretty well in a zone five. I think we have a few of these in our garden. Um, they're really fun because they get these really unique pink blooms on them. They're kind of more of that cactus feel, but I feel like they also don't, they don't like have kind of, I don't know, you, I feel like they're, they're really versatile and that you could put them in more of like a deserty type of a landscape, but then you can also put them in a landscape that's more lush and green and they'll fit there as well. <clears throat> and the nice thing about the blooms is that they bloom in the summer and then they go to fall. So it's nice to kind of have a, lot, a little bit of that color in the summertime. Um, so this one, the mock orange, this is one of my favorite shrubs because it smells so good. Um, and they're also very low water. They're hard to find. I haven't seen these in nurseries very often. I think we might've had a couple in the nursery that I used to work at last year. I think we might've gotten some in um, but I think it might've been a special order. So, but these guys are really awesome. Um, my friend, her grandma has one of these planted in her yard and it's beautiful and it's very low, but the grandma has it planted in the turf. So it can even handle a little bit more water as well. Um, and these ones are ones that bloom in the spring, but then they kind of go into the summer as well, which is nice because it, it's something that you can have a little bit of color in the summer. Um, next one is sand cherry, which is really pretty. Uh, they have these really nice white blooms in the spring. Then they get these purple berries in the um, summer, and then they get this wonderful fall color um, in the fall. Um, so they're something that's interesting the whole year round. They get to be six feet, which is kind of more on the smaller, well, like more like the medium size, I guess, of of your shrubs. Um, and then they're just a good low water, good looking shrub, right? So that's our shrubs. <clears throat> so next we're going into perennials. Um, and, be, and keep in mind, this isn't all of them. Like there, there's so many different trees and shrubs and perennials and things that you can use for, for low water landscapes. This is just a few. Um, uh, that I that I really like and that I think are really pretty. So this guy, this shrubby sandwort, this guy is really, really cool, really fun. And I think it'd do great in like kind of a rock garden type of a look, if, if that's the kind of look that you're going for for your, for your low water landscape. Um, kind of has these white blooms, blooms in spring to summer. This guy is a, is a good one for low water. These ones are really awesome. I don't feel like people use these guys enough. Um, scabiosas or pincushion flowers are ones, they come in also white and I think pink as well. So you can get them in those different colors, but they're fun because they have these really unique looking heads, um, like their flower heads on them. And they're that good purple color and they bloom for a really long time from spring to fall, which 
is really nice because lots of people are looking for something that's going to bloom for a long time. Um, and these guys will do that. Oh, and then another good thing about this one is that it does pretty well in, in part sun as well, which is good. Uh, this guy chocolate flower is really awesome. It's one of those low water plants that not a lot of people know about. Um, something really unique about them is the fact that when the sun is shining on them directly, they smell like chocolate, like they really do. You can pick the flower and, and smell it and it smells like a chocolate bar, which is pretty cool. Um, but even just walking by it, you can smell them. They have these in like a low water area at Utah State. It's, it's a, if you're ever up at Utah State, they have them um, across from the library. Um, and so you, you'll be walking around that area and you'll be like, oh man, it smells like, like chocolate. <laughs> and it's the chocolate flower. And so if you want this kind of look, they kind of start to look a little bit raggedy once all the flowers are kind of getting spent. So if it's something that like you want to have that scent, you kind of want to have that yellow, but you don't want it to be like the main thing, you can kind of put it in a little bit of the background and then put something that's a little bit more um, like more pretty, but then you'll have that kind of sensation of when you walk by that it smells the way that it does. Um, so next is hummingbird mint. Uh, this one is really awesome due to the fact that it's low water. It comes in a variety of colors. So this one, um, I think is a sunset, sunset hummingbird mint, I think is what, what the name is. But they come in just pink, they come in just purple. I think there might be um, more of just like, just the peach color, not any of the, the pink. This one is a mixture of the, of the pink and the, the peach, but. Um, I really like hummingbird mint. It's just one of those ones that give you really good color. Um, they also have a like a really kind of a sweet, sweet minty smell to them when you when you rub the leaves. Um, these ones are a little bit more on the warmer. They need a little bit more of the warmer temperatures. So just kind of keep that in mind. But these ones are really good. Um, these rock rose, we actually, we have, well, I guess we have some of the hummingbird mint in our garden as well, but these ones are in front of uh, the conservation, the new conservation building. They are starting to bloom right now, which is fun. Um, but they're really cute. They're, they're lower growing, but they spread, which is nice. Um, it's a good, like, kind of front and center type of a plant. Um, and then they get a bunch of these little, little flowers that will just kind of bloom until bloom into this summer. And these also come in pink and then yellow and white, I believe. Um, these sundowns are daisies. We have all over the area. It's a it's the water tank area where we have our demonstration of more of our low water plants. We have like a cactus and succulent demonstration. And these guys do super well. We actually have some that reseeded themselves. Um, and they don't get any water at all, and they're just the happiest that they can be. Um, they're really awesome because they bloom in kind of that later spring and then through the summer. They'll bloom all summer long, which is awesome. Um, they don't get very big, but they make a really cute little, cute little plant. And there's a good one because you can put a bunch of them all together, and then it kind of creates this look like, like you see in the picture here. <clears throat> um, next one is evening primrose. This is a really, really good, um, very low water use. Uh, you do want to be careful with these guys because they can spread pretty easily. Um, so, I mean, we have like, we put this in one part of our garden and it's starting to spread to different parts just because the seed heads are just so good at traveling and then exploding their seeds everywhere. So this is one that if you have this one, because they're awesome, it's a ground cover um, type of a look. And they have these really pretty flowers and the seed heads are even like pretty interesting looking, but it is one that um, once the seed heads come and, and once it starts getting colder and it kind of browns and things, you do want to get that cleaned up as soon as possible and make sure you get all the, all the little seed heads. 
Um, next, I have this Rocky Mountain Penstemon, which is native to Utah, um, and it does it does very well in in landscapes, but it does need low water. Um, it doesn't do super well with high water use or even medium. Um, it is this kind of purplish color, and there are a ton of different penstemons. So I have another one here, um, which is pine leaf penstemon. This one's a little bit smaller than this guy. So, I mean, your Rocky Mountain penstemon gets up to two feet and spreads around three feet, right? Whereas your pine leaf penstemon only gets to be around 10 inches high and only spreads to like one foot wide. So the penstemons are awesome because they'll be blooming kind of late spring and then into summer. And there's a variety of colors. There's there's purples, there's reds, yellow, pink. Um, there's even some with like a darker foliage with like a white flower on them. So these guys are a really good one to add a lot of color and variation. Um, so we can go, so this is a, a cactus. We have some of these in our garden. Um, and I like how these look. I think that they're really cool. They are not for those who are wanting a landscape for kids to play in or anyone to play in because they are extremely pokey. <laughs> As I hope that everyone would know that a cactus is not something that you play around with, right? Um, but even like the maintenance of cacti, I, I just maintain, I just tried to clean out the leaves and stuff out of ours and I got poked few times. Um, it was just kind of painful, but they can look really beautiful. If we go, if we think back to the, the first picture on, on my slide, um, there's that cacti with the rocks, right? And I thought that was, I thought that was really beautiful. It was something that I have considered putting into my landscape, um, but it's just the maintenance is a little bit higher on these, on the cacti. Um, but even like our cactus garden, it's, it blooms in the, in the summer. Um, spring gets kind of like, I think it's like early, late spring into early summer is when it blooms. So they have these beautiful blooms um, and they look really great and they're really unique and things. So if this is the kind of look that you wanna go for, we have a ton of different kinds of, of cacti in our little demonstration. Um, that you definitely should come and look at because there's a bunch of different kinds and um, and they all have done pretty well and they do pretty well in our climate. You do wanna make sure if you're, if you live kind of up in your higher elevations, you wanna be a little bit more careful because your cacti are more on the warm side. So zone five to 10 usually is where they're at. Some of them I think that we have in our garden are even in zone six. So you do wanna make sure that you're doing things that are going to work in your zone. All right, so next, Agave Utahensis, which is Utah century plant. We have one of these um, in, our, in our cactus um, demonstration, and it's actually doing really good. Um, zone five to 10, and it's, it's really happy. They stay smaller in there, but they're that awesome blue color, um, very low water use. They do get a little bloom on them as well. And the bloom will kind of, it'll come out of like the middle of the plant usually. Um, but these guys are, are another one that kind of gives a bold statement to a low water landscape. So they're just fun if you want to do something like that. But again, very pokey. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, so next are Coreopsis. And this one is called Moonbeam. There are some other ones as well that, because this one is a little bit more airy but there are other ones that are, the flowers are a little bit bigger and they're more on like stalks kind of, um, instead of kind of all over like a little bushy type of looking thing. Um, but these ones are, are low water, really pretty, and then they'll be blooming forever. Like these guys are just bloom, they bloom all summer long. Um, and really pretty, they add like kind of a, a shine to your plant bed with the yellow. Um, and then they, they go down to a, a lower hardiness zone, which is really nice as well. Next one is Zauschneria. This is one of my favorite perennials. Um, and it's it doesn't get to be very tall, but it's another spreader one. And it's awesome because I feel like I'm going to use in a versatile type of waste. You can have it more in like a low water setting where it's more of like 
you have gravel and rocks and then you have this kind of blanket of red flowers or you can have it in more of a lush setting like the bottom picture um, and, it, and it works in both. So next we're going into some low water ground covers. So this guy, it's a shrub, but I put it in the ground covers because it does act. So I guess the the um, the green leaf manzanita, that one is technically kind of a ground cover shrub also. <laughs> uh, but I put this one in there because it just, it does so well and it spreads so far also. And we have some of this in our garden. Um, I'm really excited for just to see the fall color. I wasn't working here when, when it had its fall color. So I'm really excited to see it at that point. Um, but it's a good, a good, just like really lush green ground cover. And then it gets that really brilliant fall oranges and reds. Um, this is another really awesome one. Uh, this is probably, well, one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorite plants, but this guy makes like one of the top <laughs> because not only is it low water, it can pretty much live with like zero water. Because So when I worked at the farm at Utah State, um, we had these in a bed and we were cleaning out the beds. We were getting them, getting ready to redo all of them. And so my boss was like, we need to take those out, we'll clean them up and then spray them with Roundup just to kill them, just so that we can get rid of them. And so we did that. But then like we didn't do anything else we kind of just like still kept the plant in the ground and um it definitely came back to life so not only are they low water but they're super hardy um and then they spread really far and they're beautiful they get these wonderful blooms that bloom forever they bloom super long and so this guy is a great one for your park strips i would think um they do really well at being pruned back they are able to tolerate even like they tolerate like they live through Roundup at my work, so they'd be able to tolerate your salts coming off of the the snow from the streets and things. Um, so these guys are, are really good low water spreader. Um, this one's really good, the Salvia dorii. Um, it stays pretty low to the ground and then spreads a little farther. But this one is a very low water use. Um, it kind of has that kind of sagebrush type of a look, but then it has these cute little purple flowers as well. This one, sedum. So any of your sedums are gonna be, well, there's your sedums that are ground covers and then there's sedums that are just your kind of perennials. I should have added sedum as a perennial too, because those ones are super good. They're low water as well, and they get fall blooms, which is really awesome. Um, but so there's, there's the perennial, like they get to be around two feet tall by one and a half foot wide, I think, sedums. And then there's these guys that only get to be about a half foot tall and they spread, uh, I would say they spread farther than a foot and a half, I think. I mean, I've seen them farther than that. But um, this one's called Dragon's Blood because it turns this kind of red color in the fall. Um, they have spring or I mean summer blooms that are pink and they're really good for, for rock gardens. You need just like really good low water ground cover. Um, sedums are, are really awesome. Your, your creeping sedums. Uh, woolly thyme is actually one that is low water and it's a really good ground cover. It stays pretty low like yeah, like uh, about a fourth of a foot. So stays pretty low to the ground. Kind of creates like a blanket type of a look. Um, this is a good one if you have a small area that you want it to be grass, but you can't water it efficiently, right? Because it's if it's smaller than, than eight feet. So if you have a really small area that you're like, I just like kind of want like a really good ground cover in this area that looks like grass. Woolly thyme is one of those that does pretty well in that type of a setting. It doesn't do super good with people stepping all over all the time. So maybe having stepping stones in the middle of it or just having it in an area that doesn't get walked on, but you want kind of that look. Um, it'll work pretty well in there. And this other one, Turkish Veronica, is another really great ground cover. Um, 
it's it's again not one that loves to be walked on but i mean this is i think this type of look is really pretty um having it all over the stepping stones with it being on the stepping stones you might have to eventually kind of like pull it back a little bit to uncover your stepping stones because it can start to grow over and kind of cover those stones um the thing about veronica though is that it, it um it actually does really like pretty well in the shade. It'll take full sun as well, but it does it does good in the sh shade also. So next, we're going to talk about some ornamental grasses, which are low water as well. Um, and so this one, big blue stem. This is a really awesome grass. It gets to be six feet tall, so it's pretty big, but it's nice because it can take up an area, um, and there's a really good like kind of a backdrop type of a plant. And it has kind of that bluish hue. And then in the fall, um, it kind of gets a nice, I think these ones turn like an orangish color. So next are blue grama. This is, so we had the grama grass, like the turf kind of grama grass, and then we have um, blue grama as an ornament grass as well. Um, it's a more on the smaller side, so it gets around three feet tall, three feet wide. They're, they're really cool. The seed heads, I always remember them because they look like eyebrows. Um, so you can always remember blue grandma, the little seed heads look like an eyebrow. <laughs> um, fall color is kind of variable. It's kind of like a greenish yellow type of a look. Um, but these guys are really, a really nice grass. We have these in our, in our kind of, front garden in front of our gazebo area. So little blue stems um, are really awesome as well. We have a lot of these in our park strips um, over at our gardens. And they're really awesome because they have this kind of contrast between their summer color and their fall color because summer color is kind of this bluish. Sometimes there's a little bit of purple in there but in the fall, they have this, this like really intense fall orange color, which is awesome. It's kind of like a bronzy type of look. Um, this one in particular is a good one because it stays smaller. So it's like three feet tall and then it only gets to be around two feet wide. So it's good for like smaller areas where you would like a little bit of height. You don't want to like do a shrub because shrubs will get too wide, um, but they stay, these ones stay a little bit skinnier, but they, then they get a little bit on the taller side as well. Um, this is probably one of uh, it's 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 one of my favorite grasses just because it's so unique and different looking. Um, especially if you have just one of these in an area, it's like it looks like glitter almost um, because the little they have the little seed heads on them. The little seeds are so small, and they so they just like catch the sun on them and then they just blow so easily in the wind. Um, so these guys are really awesome. Very, very low water um, and they just kind of have this really unique look that can give you a great look in your low water landscape. So we've talked about specific plants um, and I wanted to kind of give you all some combinations and kind of put some of those plants together so we can start seeing how things look together. Um, and seeing like, hey, I don't need to have a low water landscape that's only sagebrush and rocks. I can have a low water landscape that has these three plants that look really nice together, or I can and I can add other things that that match it. So this is one kind of combination I came I came up with. So we have kind of our shrubby ground cover that gets around three feet tall, right? But then spreads, so we have that in an area. And then we add our, our add our perennials kind of around, and then we have maybe a section that we have our, our cacti as a ground cover as well. And then maybe you have like your trees in the background. But this kind of works with color combinations and different textures and things so that we're getting like a mixture of color, texture, um, and size. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite combinations, having this blue color, like silvery blue with the yellow and red. I love that combination of uh, colors together. Um, 
but we're just kind of keeping in mind, right? So our sagebrush there, that's three to four feet tall. And we have our penstemon, which is like two to three feet. And then our Sundancer daisy, which stays about a foot tall. So we have variation in size there. And we also have a variation in um, color and then also in bloom shape. So kind of keeping that variation with the combinations. Um, this would be a really beautiful combination, having that that green of the evergreen and then a splash of white blooms with a lower kind of ground covery red and then having one of these um, the alkali sacaton grasses kind of being in its own area. And then this one kind of staying more on a purplish pink kind of spectrum. So remember the blooms on our curl leaf mountain mahogany are more on that pink side. So it kind of has a pink hue. And then we have our purple um, desert four o'clock. And then this is a penstemon down at the bottom. That's a pink color. So that's a, like a kind of a good combination if you're staying kind of in that purple pink color wheel. Then this one plays around a little bit with colors that match each other, each other and then also contrast each other. And so that's all of the um, information I have about water rise landscaping. I hope that you all were able to see how having a low water landscape doesn't just have to be boring, kind of desert type of a look. That's that's was kind of like my main thing with this class is showing you that you can have a really beautiful lush landscape that can still be water wise in low water. Um, but yeah, so I hope you're able to, to learn some good stuff. And Dave has been doing awesome at answering questions. And if there's any other questions for me now, we can we can answer them. There, there aren't. But did any, you want to add anything else, Dave? I was going to say there, there aren't any questions yet. But you know, just one, one thing maybe to help people consider is, is that sometimes water-wise or low water is is more about behavior than the actual plant. I mean, there are some some fantastic plants that tolerate very low water conditions. And we would advocate that you use those, put them in, use them. And Hattie Ann has showed you a small sampling of, of some of this stuff. But a lot of this is behavior. Don't expect your landscape to be water-wise by just planting a whole bunch of water-wise plants and not changing your irrigation habits. You right. can change over to drip irrigation in the beds, change your scheduling of how you how you irrigate these things. Group plants with similar water needs together, you know, that the lawn principles that we've talked about. If you'll do those things, you'll end up with a, a water efficient landscape. And then if you incorporate lower water plants, then you'll even be more water efficient in your landscape. And so your water use will continue to decline kind of depending on the level of how you do this stuff. So that, that's all I would add, I think, to that. Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah. There's a question about where to get white pine. White pine yeah. trees. I'm I'm wondering if they're talking about the let me see. white fir. Yeah. Um. Possibly. Which, I I would throw out, I would throw out just. Word. Yeah, it could be the white fir. Um. There is a white pine. There is a white fir. It, depending on what they're what you're looking for. Um. You you just need to look at local nurseries, wherever you like to shop. White fir is a pretty common one. It's pretty typical in a nursery land. You know, white pine, different cultivations of white pine are also pretty common. So just check check availability in nurseries, check sizing. One, one thing, we always talk about nurseries and stuff. With last year's pandemic, a lot of people were at home and a lot of people started doing landscaping. This year, it's kind of a carryover to that. So you may find that some plants that were very, very available growers just the landscape industry cannot respond super quickly because uh, they're growing stuff right they're growing things up maybe two or three years before it's marketable in a nursery and so wholesale growers 
they may be behind a little bit this year with the demand they saw last year. So, but definitely look around at your nurseries and just ask some questions, ask, they'll be getting truckloads of material in. And so if you can't find something you're looking for, just ask the people at the nursery, tell them what you're looking for and ask them if you'll be able to get it this year. Yeah, I would, I would definitely um, say that as well. I know that, so I worked in a nursery last summer and um, it seemed like, especially the low water plants, it seemed like we'd get those in and they'd immediately be bought. So, um, I mean, so there's a question asking about recommendations for nurseries that carry the water rice plants. Um, and I mean, they all, I mean, I've seen them at, at multiple different nurseries, uh, a bunch of different low water plants. So, I mean, definitely just kind of check your local nurseries and then also check with them to see if, if it's something that they're gonna be getting in because they usually have an idea of what they want to get, what they want to get in, um, and then what's what's more popular or what's available. They usually have that information, um, so you just want to check with uh, your local nurseries to see if that's something that they um, will be getting in or that they usually get in. Um, but yeah, there's another question about where in which nurseries carry more waterwise plants, and I think you kind of answered that. If the level of water wise is, is all over the place and most nurseries are starting to carry what, what's considered water wise. If you wanna go really toward native plants, ask specifically at nurseries. You know, Willard Bay Garden has historically done a lot of low water. They have kind of a little niche. It's located in Willard up along the Old Fruit Highway. But there's a wholesale grower in Layton called Perennial Favorites. They're growing a lot of great stuff and they're, they wholesale that to lo local nurseries all along the Wasatch Front, yeah. Salt Lake County, you know, Davis and Weber counties. So certainly ask, like Caddy and said, ask your nurseries. If you can't find something, get online and do a few searches. There is a, a group called the Utah Native Plant Society. And if you get on their website there, I haven't been on their website in a while. There, there used to be some links to very small um, native plant growers. They may not have an actual nursery operation, but they grow the plants and they will sell them. So if you're looking for some hard to find native plants, go to the Utah Native Plant Society website. That may give you a good direction, but just, you know, your average low water stuff, you just, you just have to ask around and, and be on the lookout at any nursery. And sometimes as I was heading and said, it sells out pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and there's a question. Can you suggest more smaller low water trees, something the size of a flowering pear? Um, it's kind of hard because there's there's not a ton of smaller trees that stay that smaller size that are low water. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head. Can you think of any specific, Dave? I mean, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, they're smaller there's smaller trees like. To be honest, like your crab apples and your flowering pears, they're, they're not extremely high use water. No, no, I was actually going to say there's several crab apple varieties that can, are considered lower water trees that flower that look beautiful. Your eastern red bud would fit into that group with mm -hmm. it's a lower water, a nice spring flower. There's an American yellow wood is a great tree that's considered low water. You talked about, you know, the uh, the now just the moment the golden rain tree yeah the, it's a great one low water nice shape not too big um i'm trying to think of a few others so, so, several of the hawthorns are low yeah, water the hawthorns are they're good. a little bit you know hawthorns if you're not familiar with hawthorns they're a little thorny so they're not great <laughs> they're not <laughs> trees that kids are going to find but they're pretty they can be beautiful trees well, they have excellent they're, flowers. They're considered a little bit on the smaller side, very low water, intolerant trees. Um, even a few of the smaller maples, if, if you like maples, there's like the amber maple, the janala maple, some of those are smaller. They, they may be smaller than your flowering pear. Now flowering pear, I've seen some huge flowering pear trees. So that, that yeah. sometimes throws me off a little bit on the sizing. But if you're talking like a 20 to 25 foot tree, something like that, all the ones we've been naming kind of fit into that group, Carolyn. So yeah. that, that may give you a good start. 
Yeah, I mean, you can always call us or follow up with an additional, you know, call us with some more questions or something. We could probably help you a little bit more if you, if you have more questions. Yeah, for sure. Let's see. Um, some tips and tricks about working towards changing your irrigation to be more efficient. Where to start and the first few things to try or do, most being for your buck. Um, this is probably more of a question for you, Dave. You're a little bit more yeah. familiar with irrigation type of stuff. So what's a good place for people to start? So Brie, we did a whole we did a whole class on this just a week or so ago. And the video for that and the slides, well, they're actually, yeah, there's slides. There's slides. If you're talking about actually changing all of your irrigation system, I, I did a class in that, and I could help you a little more one-on-one -on -one if you need that help. Um, just let me know, you know, send me a phone number or something through email, and I can call you and talk through the specifics of what you're doing. But maybe just some overall general things for anybody that wants to maybe start with irrigation, fixing some things. Is Number one is just making sure that the water you are applying is, is going where it's supposed to go that doesn't cost you anything. It's just going out, making sure heads are straight up and down, make sure nothing's tilted, make sure everything's aligned. Um, if ideally getting spray just for lawn and drip in other areas, that gives you, you know, as far as reducing water use and waste and, and weed control and all that stuff, that could be a great bang for your buck. Setting your controller into proper frequencies and proper timing, that's gonna help you a lot. But all those things maybe maybe require more than you're thinking about right now or, or you don't quite know where to start. So because that's a little bit more complicated, more in depth, send me send me a phone number or something and, and I'll get with you one on one. Or if you want to come to the garden sometime, let us know when you're coming. We'll make time and we could show you some things and talk through. Bring a site plan even if you want. We could help you draw some stuff out. Yeah, for sure. Um, what was I? Oh, oh, I was going to tell. So if you want to email any of us, uh, so David, you can email him at drice at weberbasin.com. Um, so that's his email. And then my email is hfassel at weberbasin.com. So you can always email us with any any questions or concerns or things that you have, um, especially if you want a little bit more one-on-one -on -one help. Um, and then just making sure to provide a number in that email so that we can because uh, sometimes just talking over the phone is a lot easier than communicating through email. Um, yeah, so Dave, well, you're, you're, you put your email up there. I don't know how to do that on me. If, <laughs> it's, well, it's hard. Well, I will, I'll explain it later. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so yeah, so you can always email us. Um, sweet. Okay, so then do autumn blaze maples use a lot of water? They seem popular. Um, Autumn Blaze, they're like, they're kind of like medium to low. I wouldn't say that they're high water use. Um, they are, they are more popular. I have seen more Autumn Blaze maples becoming a little bit uh, more popular, but I don't know. I would say that most maples are kind of medium to low because they, I feel like they, they can tolerate a good amount of water, but they can also, they also do pretty well at, at handling low water as well, as far as I've seen. So, yeah, they are, they're, question. they're a good tree. They are popular. I would not consider them extremely low water, but they're not high water. Yeah. They are a good kind of moderate, moderate to low water. If you're watering them appropriately, they'll do fine with a little bit less. Um, yeah, they're, they're a good tree. People use them a lot. Yeah, awesome. Um, so the next question is also from the, from Brie. Those last three questions are from Brie. <laughs> You're welcome, by the way. Um, and she's asking, what's the best way to water trees deeper but still save water? Um, uh, it really depends. Like that has to do a lot with your soil type, with kind of your irrigation system. So it, it would depend on your on your soil with getting that deeper, deeper water, but as far as saving water, because a lot of people think that you need to apply a ton of water all at once. Um, and then that's gonna give you tons of water in your soil. But sometimes it's better to do like uh, maybe 15 minutes of water and then 
15 minutes of no water and then 15 minutes of water again and then no water. Am I, am I right in thinking that, Dave? I remember us doing that at the research farm. Yeah, it's a principle called cycle and soak. So it allows you to get a lot of water into the soil, but not all at the same time so that you get it deeper. You don't end up with runoff if your soil can't take it all in. So yeah, as Hattie Ann said, you, you cycle it. So it runs for 15 minutes or whatever, whatever the soil can take before it gets too, too much and starts running off. And then you just let it sit for a bit and then it cycles again. And sometimes you can do that two or three or four times in a day. Depends on your timer. If your timer allows you to do that, many of them do. They allow for cycle and soak. So, and it depends on how you're watering the tree. If, it, if it's on a drip system or if it's on sprinklers or something, that's the way you do it. If it's not really connected to anything, best way to deep water a tree is just put a hose out there, but just on a very, very low trickle and just let it run for a little while. It may run for an hour. It may run for two. Don't, don't put it on too much. This I'm talking a really low trickle so you don't get runoff anywhere. But then now that water is soaking really deep and then you only need to do that maybe every other week and just really good deep soaking. Your tree is going to be very happy and very healthy. Um, so it, it, some of it depends on how you're currently watering and what, what the sit up, setup is. But that's another one if we're, if we're going to talk to you Sounds like we're going to be talking to you about some irrigation. So we could talk about that a little more too, specifically with your situation. For sure. Awesome. Let's see. Any other questions that people have? We can put them in the Q&A box. I'll wait for just a little bit longer. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks for everybody who joined us. Um, we really appreciate you coming to our classes and we hope that you are learning from them. I hope that you're learning from me, <laughs> um, this being my first year teaching, um, but I enjoy doing it. And so we, we are grateful for all that, um, that attend our classes. I, I, think, um, I think that might be all the questions. So once again, Great. thanks. Yeah, and we'll, we'll um, Hopefully see some of you are here. I, I guess we don't even see you, but we'll hopefully have you join us again very soon. <laughs> the schedule, we've, yes. we've got a lot of classes coming up and we're glad to participate with you. And again, if you have questions, email one of us with a phone number. We're happy to call you or, or answer your question through an email and, and just address your, your more personalized questions. So thanks again. I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and end. Thanks, Hattie Ann. Okay, yep. We'll see you everybody. Right, have a good night. Yeah.